I'm Jay Krebs. I'm the CEO of Confluent and one of the co-creators of Apache Kafka. I want to welcome you to day two of Kafka Summit. I'm going to be talking today about two trends that I think are really happening in the world right now. One is the emergence of Apache Kafka and event streams as a fundamental part of the modern computing stack. And the other is the rise of public cloud and especially cloud native data systems as the way forward with data. And I'm going to talk about how these two trends intersect and a big problem that I think comes out of that and what I think the solution is. So let me start with event streams and Apache Kafka. This is something that is near and dear to all of our hearts and that we know a lot about. But nonetheless, I'm going to give my take on what's happening in this area. I think whenever something new happens, there's kind of a reductive view of that thing and an expansive view. And the reductive view is, well, nothing much has changed. And the expansive view is, you know, what if this was true in the large? What would be new and different? And the reductive view for Kafka is, it's just another message queue. We, it's just another data pipeline. We've had queues in the past. Now this is a more scalable queue. Uh, it can solve bigger problems, but there's nothing really fundamentally different. And obviously I think that's wrong. I, I take a much more expansive view of the space and I'll, I'll try to explain what I think is happening. And I, I think that this is a fundamental change in what we think of in the world of data management, data infrastructure. I think classical databases came out of a paradigm that was really built around storing data. That ultimately you have this pile of data and periodically you want to look up little bits of it. You want to poke or modify parts of it. And this is meant to be you know, what you need to serve an application. After all, the, you know, the data infrastructure is meant to be the infrastructure that supports your application. So it's worth asking if this is really all we need. After all, databases have been enormously successful. This type of application has been enormously successful. But I, I think there's something that is really fundamental that's missing in this view of the world. And that's that our conception of an application has changed. The world that databases were created for had applications which, one, were islands of data in and of to themselves. You would input data through some UI. You might fetch it back in different reports or views. But ultimately, this application was largely independent. And secondly, the application was really built for humans. Ultimately, the goal is store the data in this big pile and look up the pieces of it that you need when a human opens the app or, or goes to the website or you know, refreshes the screen. That's when the action happens. Ultimately, the data system is passive. The human is active and is causing the data system to do work. And I think both of these assumptions aren't really true in the world now. Now I think our applications are no longer islands into themselves and they're no longer passive. They need to interact with all the parts of a big complicated organization. And when you take that more limited data capability and you try and apply it in the large across the whole company, I think what you get is a giant mess. And, and we're all familiar with this. You know, this could be the architecture of the internals of any company, but, but probably it would be you know, a thousand times more complex. And where a lot of the complexity has gone is into all these squiggly lines, into all the integrations and interchanges, how this application, when it changes, impacts this other application. When this calls this, then this other thing should happen. And the reason this is happening is because applications don't stand alone anymore. Our business is built out of all these pieces of software that come together into one digital exoskeleton, one system that, that runs the operations of the company. And modern consumers expect all these to work together. They expect that when a customer experience is delivered over here, all the other parts of the apparatus adjust and take that into account. And the internal operations of a business demand this as well. If a sale occurs in this part of the business, that should percolate out into all the actions that need to be taken downstream to fulfill the logistics, report on this, you know, take action on whatever's next. And to do that requires a very high level of integration. And this has been forced on us, but without really having the right technology to back it. And the key thing that has changed in my view is that in this modern world, applications don't stand alone and the user of an application is no longer entirely or even primarily just a person. In large part, the user of our software is often more software. It's often a piece of software that needs to integrate, that needs to key off some change, that needs to react and respond. And because our, our software states are now you know, integrated across many, many different applications and systems, this is a critical part of what a modern application has to do. And this is what I think more than anything 
has driven the emergence of Kafka and event streams and stream processing. And this is meant to model a world where data management isn't just about storage, it's about both storage and the flow of data. It's about things happening and reacting to them. And it's built in a way that's meant to serve not just a human user with a UI, but actually a computer user, right? Software systems, after all, work all the time. They're always operating, they're always processing, they're always calculating. It doesn't really make sense to do things just when the application is open or just at the end of the day when some batch job runs, if that's being done by software. The software doesn't go to sleep at, at night after all, it, it can work all the time. And this I think is the fundamental change that has driven the rise of this area. And I think it's, it's much bigger than just another message queue. I think it's actually a fundamental change in what we think of as the capabilities that, that any data platform ought to have. And I think in the large, this has a huge implication for the architecture of companies. You know, I think the world of all those squiggly lines kind of interconnected in ad hoc ways, I think that's coming to a close. And I think we're seeing the emergence of an event streaming platform, something that can connect many parts of a company across many systems in a decoupled way and can allow this company to actually act as one. And this is a place where you can go and see the stream of all the activity happening in the company across different parts, tap into that, react. I think this is a very powerful thing. So that was the first trend. That was the rise of Kafka and event streams. That brings me to the second trend, the rise of the public cloud and especially of cloud native data systems. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But first I wanna talk just a little bit about this area. Like with Kafka, I think there's a reductive view of the cloud and there's an expansive view. And you know, the reductive view we've probably seen. So, so you know, as this stuff came around, you know, I saw a lot of things that said, well, you know, there is no cloud, we're just renting computers. Uh, this is just somebody else's computer. And I, you know, I, there's obviously a nice cynical take there, but, but I think we're far along enough now to see that the change that the public cloud has brought is actually incredibly cross-cutting. It touches every aspect of how applications are built, uh, how they're deployed, how they're architected, how they're configured, uh, how we observe and operate them. Everything has changed. And the CNCF has, has tried to popularize this phrase cloud native to describe this. And you know, they've mostly talked about this in, in terms of application development. And it doesn't really have you know, a precise definition, but I think it's actually a useful phrase. It's, it's you know, one of these things that we need to have a word for. I, I think it's been incredibly powerful. However, you know, I, think, I think there's something that's missed in this discussion. Our discussion is mostly on application development. It's on how we write code. And that's something, of course, software engineers love to talk about because it's what they spend their time doing. But in a business, there is something more important than code. Uh, there's something that I think is more powerful, that is more durable, that provides even more capabilities, and that's data. I think ultimately businesses run on data and the capabilities that we have around data come from the kinds of data systems and the primitives and abstractions they provide. I think that this idea of cloud native computing is at least as important when we think about what that means for data systems as it is when we you know, think about what it means for application development. And my view on this came about early on. So it came about from my, my time at LinkedIn. You know, Many people know that Kafka was created at LinkedIn, but it was actually one of a number of pieces of software that we, that we ran there. LinkedIn uh, wanted to be like Google in this respect. It, you know, in those days, that, that was seen as a really important thing to develop these capable, you know, capabilities around data systems that could scale and to bring them to bear to, to help power the business. And so we went through this curve of trying to build out different systems, adopt open source technologies. And the first phase was always putting it to use for one application, making one application successful. But once we'd done that, that's when the hard part would come. That's when we would try to scale it out to work across the organization, to try and provide it as a fundamental primitive that anybody could have on demand for anything they were building whenever they wanted. And that was brutally difficult to do. And it was difficult, not just for Kafka or for the key value stores or for Hoopa, it was difficult for all of them. Even the commercial software that we, we bought had that same scaling difficulty as we tried to offer it out. And as we went through this learning process of trying to figure out how to do it, we, we realized that fundamentally what we were trying to provide was a type of service. Now it was a very primitive service, 
It was invoked often by customers coming and requesting something and filing a JIRA ticket, but, but it was a service nonetheless. And, and often I would encourage the teams that, that were part of this overall effort to think in terms of the APIs they would have and think in terms of their, their internal customers being you know, real customers that, that would have expectations, that we would have deliverables, that we would have SLAs, that we would you know, try to support and make successful. And we realized that process of bringing something out to an organization was, was absolutely the hardest part. And we even joked internally that you know, the, the, the privilege of getting to write custom data systems was really just a, a way to entice software engineers to do the hard work of actually operationalizing and, and scaling and operating them across a big organization. And because of this background, I, I was immediately impressed uh, when I saw the rise of these cloud native data systems. And you know, for those who don't remember, the first releases in AWS actually weren't EC2. It wasn't really what we would think of as infrastructure as a service. It wasn't networks and servers. It was actually SQS and S3. It was cloud native data systems. I think those two systems do a great job of actually drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is the service, this is what you get, this is what you pay per operation. And all the rest is magic that we handle for you under the covers. And those were just the first of what's been a whole wave of systems in this area. This idea of cloud native data systems and what they provide, it gets less attention, but I think it's equally important. And, and it's equally hard to define. I, I don't think there's a single characteristic you could point to where you would say, oh, it means this. It means that they're elastic. It means this other thing. But I, I think there are a set of things you would insist on it, it, to say that something is a proper cloud native data system. It has to be able to elastically scale. It has to provide capabilities to you in units that are serverless, that, that scale just with your needs. That you don't have to think about arbitrary servers and their type and configuration to figure out what you're getting. Um, it has to be able to you know, grow without bound. It has to have API-driven operations. It has to be global and work across different environments, across regions and availability zones. Um, th these are a few of the things I think we would insist on for any definition of a cloud-native data system. And, and the key point is none of these characteristics are shallow. None of them are things you can just take an existing piece of software and bolt on top and say, okay, we had this you know, do-it-yourself software system. Now it's a cloud-native service. Uh, because we've bolted this on top. You actually can't. These are deep cross-cutting concerns that are about how the system is architected, how it's operated, how it's developed, how it's throttled and managed. Th these are hard things that are right at the core of the design of these systems. I think this is a really important observation because I think that this type of system is the future. I think this is how we are going to be getting all of our data capabilities as we go forward. I, I think that the power of you know, having this taken care of for you as a service is really liberating for, for teams that, that want to build things. I, I think it gets our, our best people into building the applications. And I, I think going forward, systems that, that have these characteristics are going to be successful. And the ones that don't are going to go the way of the dinosaur. And that leads me to what I think is a big problem. So if cloud native data systems are the future, and if Kafka and event streams are becoming a foundational primitive in, in how we think and work and, and build modern software systems. Well, we, we have a real gap because most people's experience of Kafka is, is far from cloud native. You know, you may start with the idea of relatively simple primitives, event streams, events, consumer groups, like these, these things make sense. They have, they have no aspect of uh, server or low level detail tied to them. But when you go to get it, there's actually quite a lot there. You kind of lift the hood and suddenly to get those things, you're dealing with deployment scripts and security patches and upgrades. You're fiddling with Zookeeper. You're learning more than you probably wanted to about garbage collection in the JVM. There's, there's a lot of real toil to actually getting Kafka and actually delivering it, and much more so if you want to do that at scale. And you know, I, I think that this is, is a big issue. In fact, we might ask, you know, if, if these cloud native capabilities are so important, why is Kafka winning at all? And indeed, this is, this is a question I asked myself when, when Kinesis was first released. So I was, I was working at LinkedIn. The team there had spent a lot of time building Kafka, we'd released it as open source. So it was a little bittersweet to see AWS release a service that had very similar APIs right down to the kind of wonky uh, consumer uh, API that we had at the time and even started 
with the letter K. And we thought, well, the good news is we, we built something that was worth copying. And the bad news is uh, there probably won't be any Kafka in the cloud. And the reality, of course, turned out quite different. So over the years that followed, what we saw was not only did Kafka continue to succeed in the, in the cloud, it actually flourished. And you know, even before the rise of any kind of managed Kafka services, there was more Apache Kafka in the cloud than there was Kinesis. And so it's worth asking, well, why might that be? What, what led to that? And it turns out, although you know, these, these cloud native capabilities are incredibly important, there's some things Kafka does really well. There's, there's some things that really matter that Kafka gets right. And when I talk to people about this and I ask them, well, you know, why are you using Kafka? Why not just use Kinesis? I, I often get an answer that is something like, well, you know, it's just a better product. But, but what does that mean? Well, I, th I think it means a number of different things. One thing that, that I think it means is it has to do with the completeness of the offering. You know, I think Kafka was built by a group of people that, that were trying to think through this problem end to end. What do you need? to build an event streaming application. Well, clearly you need to be able to you know, publish and subscribe to event streams. You need to be able to read and write. And you need to be able to do that in all the different programming languages, but it's not just that. You need to be able to store this uh, event streams over a long period of time, whether they're compacted or retained by time. You need to be able to process them. The, the stream processing capabilities make it much, much easier to build rich applications around event streams. And, and you need the ability to connect into existing systems and capture streams of events with, without having to write ad hoc code. And I think it's not just a matter of solving all these problems, but trying to solve them together, trying to have a set of shared abstractions, terminology, configuration, security practices that cover all of this. It just makes it much, much easier to build an end-to-end -end event stream application. And I think this completeness matters quite a lot. And I think it's definitely one of the things that's made Kafka successful. Another thing people point to is just performance. You know, if you're trying to do something across a company at scale, one of the things that matters quite a lot is performance. How fast, how predictable, you know, how low is the latency? Can you count on that? Can you count under that under odd circumstances? This is something I think Kafka does really well. And we, we just did a really thorough, fair benchmark, I think, of Kafka and some of the other messaging systems out there. We put it up on our blog. I, I won't try and you know, recreate all the details here of that set of experiments. But, but you know, the result of that was uh, Kafka remains in the lead here. It, it remains the, the fastest system around the basics of, of messaging. And you know, it's gotten better and better at this over the years. But, but I think that's not even the main thing. You know, I, I think if I was gonna point at something, I would point at something a little more abstract, which is I think that Kafka really comes with a point of view. It has an opinion on what's needed to build this kind of real-time event streaming application. And the people who have helped build it have, have a shared view of where it's trying to get to. And I think that this is something that's really hard to copy. I think if you try and build something that is you know, Kafka, but as a service, uh, or Kafka, but with a few more features, it's really hard to actually overtake it because Kafka's continued to evolve over the years. It didn't start with that complete set of APIs. Uh, it started with just simple pub sub, and it evolved to that. It's really hard to surpass something if, if you're kind of just trying to catch up to it, it's sort of the copy of a copy phenomenon. Somehow the, the second copy just never has quite the same fidelity that the original does. Something's, something's lost in translation. And I think that this gets at what people are talking about when they say Kafka is just a better product. It, it really comes down to a thousand little things, little details that are needed to get an application right. And I, I think that this comes from something that is maybe an even bigger advantage uh, and maybe this is the, the number one advantage that, that Kafka has had. And, and that's the community. That's, that's all of you. That's all of the people who have come together to make this happen. We tend to think in terms of software, in terms of features, in terms of capabilities, but the actual value comes when we build systems, when we build applications, and the knowledge for how to do that, how to do it well, the understanding and wisdom and practices that are built up by a group of people, this is actually incredibly valuable. And it's something that has given the Kafka community this point of view. It's something that has helped us to understand the applications that are important, the next feature that needs to be built. And it's also something that has produced another output, which is equally important, 
And that is the vast ecosystem of technology that integrates with Kafka. That this is the, the data systems that have connectors, the stream processing systems that have integrations, the SaaS layers that integrate, all the legacy systems it can plug into and pull event streams out of. All of this is code that you end up not having to write. And I, I think that is incredibly important and easily overlooked. You know, Kafka is a medium large code base. Uh, it definitely solves some hard problems. It would certainly be hard to rewrite it, but the ecosystem of integrations is a thousand times larger. It is literally a thousand times larger and rewriting that is impossible. And the set of things that that unlocks in a company, the ability to actually plug into what you've got that is one of the most important things in this space. And I, I think that touches at why open platforms tend to win. You know, when I think about that, that competition with Kinesis, I think one of the most important things is that open platforms, they just have this weird tendency to survive and to thrive. And we've seen this over and over again in our industry, whether it's x86 or TCP IP or Linux or email, they're all open in different ways. But that ability to have a community, to have an ecosystem of other technologies around it, that ends up being incredibly important and a key characteristic of their success. So all of those, I think, are reasons that Kafka you know, deserves to live. It deserves to, to continue to thrive. But I think if we want that to remain the case, if we want that to remain the case while you know, we, we move more and more of our workloads and environments to the cloud, while we rely and expect more and more on the capabilities of cloud native data systems, it may not be possible to have these, these two things, these two trends remain independent. I don't know if we can continue to have Kafka be this kind of self-managed or at best semi-managed where some vendor kind of puts it on servers, but ultimately you're responsible for, for poking it and saying how many servers you want and what their characteristics are. Uh, I, I don't know if we can have this world where Kafka is a semi-managed thing, but cloud native data systems are, are taking over the world. I, I think it's very likely that, that these have to come together. So those are a few of the reasons that I think Kafka has succeeded so far. But I think we have to ask the question, is, is this a permanent state of affairs? Uh, if Kafka remains something which is self-managed or at best semi-managed, where you kind of have a vendor that can put it onto servers as a service, but you're ultimately responsible for picking those servers and upgrading it and maintaining it from, from then on. Can that actually exist in a world where cloud native data systems are taking over in every other area of data management? And, and I think the answer is, that it can't, that this isn't a sustainable resting place. And to try and address this, Confluent undertook what we call project metamorphosis. And you know, this is both a, a Kafka pun, uh, as well as a reference to the transformation that, that we're trying to go through. We, we don't think you should have to pick between what makes Kafka great, the ecosystem, the point of view, all of that, and these cloud native characteristics. We, we think that you should really ought to be able to get both of those together. And, and this isn't a small undertaking. It's not a matter of, uh, like I said, just putting the, the software onto some servers. It really is deep development of a set of core capabilities. And so you know, these are things that in many cases we've been working on for years, but, but we structured a set of releases over the, the second half of this year to, to try and achieve this. And we've been doing these one per month with each release focused on one of the major capabilities of cloud native systems. And so in May, we did the first of these and it, it focused on what I think is, if anything, the most foundational characteristic, which is elasticity. You know, this means that you can dynamically create Kafka clusters, uh, you can scale them up on the fly all the placement of data, rebalancing, expansion, that's all taken care of for you. And you can get rid of them, throw them away when you're done. And uh, that, that elasticity, I think, is, is a core capability. And this video actually shows something I think is really cool. It shows an application going you know, from, from relatively light load, maybe 100 megabytes per second, and then suddenly scaling up to gigabytes per second of throughput. And, and this is something uh, that when I saw it, 
I actually had, had mixed emotions. Um, when I thought about all the pain and suffering and late nights and emergency patches and outages and production mysteries that we went through at LinkedIn to try and achieve this kind of scale, this kind of trillion messages per day scale. Um, and then I thought of the, the fact that you could just get this suddenly in a few clicks. Um, you know, I think it's both amazing uh, but, but also kind of uh, you know, cheapens it a little bit to be able to, to make it so easy. But I, I think that's exactly the point of, of what we're trying to do. We want the hard parts to be going and building uh, your software, the, the thing that differentiates your company. And, and so these are the elasticity characteristics. This comes coupled with a proper usage-based billing model. And you know it seems almost kind of low level or crassly commercial to talk about the billing system, or, or at least very boring, but, but actually in the cloud, the, the billing model, the economic model by which you get the capabilities, that is the core of what it's all about. And so if you have an economic model, which is like, hey, pick out the instance type, you know, I want a, you know, extra large such and such instance, and I want this many of them, then you're not really providing a, a cloud native data system. And so, you know, really making it possible to elastically create Kafka clusters to get KSQL or connectors to scale those out as you need to, uh, and to be able to have that all charge under the same account. This is, this is a critical part of what we're trying to accomplish. The second month we've, we focused on cost effectiveness. Again, this, is, this may seem like a mundane thing, but I think this is one of the huge powers of the cloud. This is not just about you know, making things cheap at scale. Actually, the first thing we did was focus on the low end, scaling costs down. Kafka has a reputation for being a system that is kind of a, a heavy hammer, something you only pull out for the biggest, hardest problems. And I think that that's unfortunate. I think actually the abstractions in this space that Kafka provides are better. And you wanna use them not just for really big, high scale applications, but also for little ones. There's plenty of small, important apps that could benefit from this. But, but it's actually hard to make the case that you ought to do that in a world where you have to undertake all the pain of operationalizing a big distributed system. But, but in the cloud, that's no longer the case. So, so we actually allow this to scale down. You can start and try it out for free and, and you can run permanently for you know, a few dollars a month uh, at, at low scale for a small application. And that, that cost scales up as you get to larger scale. And, and so this can actually be you know, a very effective ingredient now for even small applications. You can start with the right abstraction. And that scales all the way up to massive scale. The demo I showed before, and there's a ton of work in engineering that goes into getting good utilization, tuning the instances. You have to do this across all the clouds, of course, to really get the right performance out of the system and make the performance what, what you're selling. And I think this is one of the big changes in the cloud as well. You know, I came from an era where computer programmers were trained to think about performance. They were trained to think about how many CPU instructions does it take to compute this or that. But, but nowadays, we don't really care about that. We actually care about cost. In many ways, cost is the new performance. We don't care about how many CPU instructions. We care about you know, those instructions and how much they cost. And the ability to roll up all the right ingredients and target this for just the system that you're gonna deliver, that's an incredibly specialized thing that no company really wanted to take all the way to the end, unless that's their core business. When you've done this well, it actually allows something really amazing. One of the things I always liked about open source uh, was not just that you get the source code, but also that it was free. And so you could build these big systems without being as constrained by cost. And one of the things that's amazing about cloud services when they're done right, is they can actually be cheaper than just free. If you take into account all the hardware and you take into account all the people that you actually need to build a self-managed system, it's actually quite expensive. Even if, even if the software component doesn't cost you anything, you're still putting a lot into that operationalization. You're building the scripts that operate it. And then typically with these big distributed systems, you're paying for a lot of underutilized capacity and you have large teams of overworked people who you are you know, struggling to keep it up. And, and if this is done well, actually cloud systems can be net net cheaper. And I think that's an amazing thing. The next capability that, that we launched was infinite storage. And this is one of the coolest. Storage in Kafka has always been something you have to think about. It's always there in the back of your mind. How much more space do we have on the local disks? Are we filling up such and such a partition? 
what will happen to performance if we end up with too much stored data and consumers come and read that? Um, all of this kind of planning and pre-allocation that, that makes you have to predict what all your different applications are gonna need to do. And we wanted all that to go away. And, and so in Confluent Cloud now, you can actually just write and it will figure out all the storage needs and expand itself for you. And so this, this video is actually showing something I think pretty incredible. It, it's taking a cloud cluster, it's writing at large scale, and it just keeps going. And, and we wrote into this cluster for a little over a day. We wrote a petabyte of data before replication. Uh, and we just started with zero bytes and wrote and wrote and wrote. And what did, what did we have to do in the way of planning and operationalization and testing and, and so on to, to think about that? We didn't have to do anything. We just wrote it. That was it. And the storage was automatically taken care of for us. And I, I think this is incredibly powerful. It's one less thing that you have to worry about. And that's exactly what you need. The fourth capability is doing this everywhere. I, I think this is a hard requirement for, for modern cloud systems. The reality is the world is diverse. It exists in many places. And so we built this stack in such a way that it can run really well in, in the three major clouds, in, in Amazon, in Google, in Azure. We've now made it available under the marketplaces of these accounts so that you can purchase it and draw down your committed spend with these cloud providers. Uh, and, and it feels very much like you know, a native cloud ingredient. You can get it in whatever regions uh, your applications are built. So if you're running in AWS US East, you can get Confluent Cloud in AWS US East and have it right there for you with private networking connectivity. And we try to make as much of this as we can available uh, in the private cloud as well. So obviously, we, you know, things like billing and marketplace don't, don't necessarily apply there. But a lot of these core capabilities we're, we're releasing, uh, they run on top of Kubernetes. This is part of our Confluent platform offering. The 6.0 version of that comes with a lot more goodies. You should check it out if you're interested in that. So that was the first four months of Project Metamorphosis. Uh, there's still four more months to go. I, I think some of the coolest stuff is still coming. And since this Kafka Summit, I wanted to provide a preview of what we're announcing. A set of capabilities around global operations. What this is going to make it possible to do is mirror data between Kafka clusters in any cloud and do that while preserving all the offsets and do it transparently with no additional operational capabilities. Just simple command sends your data between all these environments so that it's all perfectly in sync. Consumers can fail over transparently from one to the other. This is one more complicated thing that you no longer have to worry about. And I think that's a really good thing. So, so this has been our goal to bring together Kafka and the world of cloud native data systems. And I, I think this is an incredibly important initiative for, for Confluent, but, but I think actually for the Kafka community as well. Um, you know, it comes from what I shared about that journey at LinkedIn. You know, I, I said that you know, LinkedIn wanted to have the kind of data capabilities that, that Google had. Uh, we wanted to be able to really take advantage of our data to harness it, to build applications around it, that that was gonna be, you know, an incredibly important and differentiating capability for us. And that was the charter of the data infrastructure team that I was a part of. Uh, but one of, one of the realizations I had was, even as we were trying to provide this as a service, you know, even as I told the team, you know, think about what you deliver like an API. Think, think about our users as your, your customers. The reality was, if we were a service, we weren't a very good one. We were kind of like the phone company in the 70s, where you, know, you could get any data system you wanted as long as it was one of the four that we supported. And you could call our APIs, but calling our API often involved you know, filing a JIRA and waiting for months or, or quarters until we could deliver the capacity for you. And the reality was our, our customer service wasn't great, right? And I think that this isn't that uncommon. I think very often this process of really trying to operationalize the broad use of data capabilities is really, really difficult. And the ability to do that as a first quality service is, is, is not quite there. And, and I think that that's changing enormously with the cloud. I, I think that we're really rewriting the boundary between what we build and what we buy right now. I think this is something that is a decision that's always you know, existed in our industry. We don't, we don't build our own CPUs, no matter what you're doing in your data center. That's because over time, you know, where you wanna spend your time and where you can differentiate changes. 
And I think that we're in the middle of one of those transitions right now. I think that although, you know, for LinkedIn at that time in, you know, 2009, 2010, it made sense to be building up these big teams internally to kind of operationalize open source systems or develop custom systems. Um, I, I think that may no longer make sense. I, I, I think that the team that I built and ran at LinkedIn, I, I probably wouldn't be building now. I think that if you want to be like Google now, the way to do that isn't to build the way Google built. It isn't to build the way that LinkedIn built. Um, it's actually to, to get these capabilities as a service. You can do that faster, you can do it better. And, and I think that's a very powerful thing. And I think this is important, you know, not just for Confluent, it's not just about our service. I think this is actually important for Kafka itself. I think that ultimately, you know, unless there are real cloud native offerings around open source projects like Kafka, I don't think that they're gonna be successful in the modern world. I think, you know, over time, if there wasn't such a thing for Kafka, I think Kinesis would be the thing that we built around, despite all the advantages an open platform has. And so I think it's incredibly important that these kind of things arise and, and we're excited to be doing it at Confluent. I'm sure we won't be the only ones, but I think this is a really powerful thing. And it produces really good output in the software itself, really great contributions to the community. One of the ones that's going on right now is the work on KIP 500, the Zookeeper removal. We felt this was a key thing for being able to scale elastically we thought this was a key limiting factor. And you know, there's a team right now that has a goal of having a zookeeper-free Kafka by the end of the year, which is not, not that far away, that can scale to millions of partitions on a single cluster. And I, I think that's gonna be an amazing thing. I think it will make it even simpler to operate for those doing it themselves in their own data centers. It's gonna make it a lot easier to run a, a managed service the way that we do. So I think there's huge synergy in, in the efforts here. And I think these kinds of investments the ability to get this kind of stuff as a service, I think this is key. I think ultimately, if we want to build something which is part of the modern stack, if we want to make it really ubiquitous, we have to make it easy. I think time and again, what I've seen in our industry is the capabilities that are both powerful and easy, those are the ones that succeed. It's not enough to be powerful on your own. You have to make something really easy to use. It has to be the simplest solution to, to the problem you have. And I think that if we do that, then we have this really exciting world ahead of us. I, I think that there's an opportunity for this to be a technology that really sits at the heart of the architecture of a modern company, that really ties together all the different systems, that, that's that locus where all of the streams of events of what's happening in a company comes together. I think that's an incredibly powerful thing to be a part of. I think it's something that we're all doing together. And I thank you all for your contributions to making that happen. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of day two of the conference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.